Well, uh, we have our uh, second of two speakers, um, uh, Janis Yortsos, uh, who is the Dean of Engineering at the Viterbi School of, of Engineering at USC. And in that context, it's, it's amazing to think about uh, coming here, uh, the west side of LA, and seeing this technological renaissance that in many ways reminds me of some kind of a hybrid between San Francisco's urban density uh, and Palo Alto's engineering prowess. And when you look at the history of Silicon Valley, uh, none of it would have occurred without great engineering schools at Stanford and Cal. And as Los Angeles rises um, in, uh, to, into the top ranks of technological innovation, in addition to its historical place in media and entertainment innovation, a large part of that has to do with the quality and the rising uh, prowess of, of USC's engineering school. So please uh, welcome Yanis uh, uh, Yortsos. Uh, yeah, thank you. Is my mic on? Great. So you can put your headphones back because I'm going to speak in Greek. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, I hope you can understand uh, the material that we'll present here. Uh, <clears throat> it's, uh, what I will try to do is give you um, a few thoughts about how we think about technology. Um, the specific and central role that engineering plays in the evolution of technology. And also uh, to try to weave in some social and uh, physical uh, aspects of technology and what differentiates between the two. Now, some of the things that I have, I'm going to say here, perhaps have been said by others before, we'll find out. Uh, you can correct me if they have been said before. I gave this talk to my undergraduate students and uh, they were all very impressed, but you know, undergraduate students are impressible people, so that's not uh, su surprised. Uh, as I move on, I want to, hmm, I think you have to go one step back. Okay, we somehow lost a slide. Um, I, use a, I wanted to dedicate this talk to uh, Chuck Vest, the former president, the late president of the National Academy of Engineering, who was the uh, emeritus, professor, uh, emeritus president of MIT. Chuck uh, was a, a, a very strong force in promoting the National Academy of Engineering Grand Challenges, which I will describe in a moment. And uh, he passed away in December uh, and I want to make sure that we acknowledge the contribution that Jack made in this area. I use a very simple definition for technology, and this is a definition that I use when I speak to prospective parents, students, and so on and so forth. And my definition doesn't include devices, does not include mathematics, does not include anything but these very simple uh, ideas, exploiting a phenomenon for useful purposes. And I think if you take everything together on what technology is, I think there are two fundamental works here, words here. One is phenomenon and the other is useful. And based on that, I think you can see the great dimensions that technology has in enabling all kinds of different things. Um, and by phenomenon, I don't mean simply a, a single phenomenon, but combinations of phenomena. So you get different phenomena that, that partner together including the discovery of a new phenomenon. So in other words, technology can be used not only to exploit a phenomenon, but advance science, and that's why technology and engineering and sciences go together, because you can exploit something to create, to, uh, as a useful purpose, to create a new phenomenon. Traditionally, the phenomena that we dealt with in engineering were physical, take for example, photoelectric effect, chemical, like materials, catalysis, and more and more biological. Take, for example, the case of brain imaging. Okay? And these are in order of increasing complexity. If you look at the uh, century of innovation, this is a, um, a book that was published by the National Academies at the beginning of 2000, of this century, uh, itemized all the great achievements of engineering in the past century. And they are all here, electrification, automobile, airplane, water supply, electronics, radio, computers, telephone, 
highway, spacecraft, imaging, internet, petroleum, nuclear technologies, high performance materials. You can imagine the fan fantastic um, uh, progress that has been made in the last century. A hundred years ago, many of these things obviously did not exist. So the slide that, I, that was omitted in my presentation here was a slide by Chuck Best who says that we live in the most exciting era for science and engineering in human history. And you can understand why this happens given the fact that just in the last century we are dealing with, with technologies that have developed um, that 100 years ago people would have never even imagined that it would be possible. What's interesting about this list here is that with the exception of one only, health technologies, every other technology was based on a physical or a chemical phenomenon. And it's only one of these that deals with health. Of course, we know that in the last 20 years or so, there has been a tremendous explosion in the area of how health technologies are being developed as part of, of uh, um, new uh, innovation in, in, in the field of uh, engineering, technology, and, and social sciences, and, and sciences in general. The next kind of map about the, where technology is headed was articulated about three years, five years ago by the National Academy. They articulated what's known the National Academy of Engineering Grand Challenges. And let me give you a list of this. One category deals with sustainability. And here it is not discovering a new device, but rather making processes interesting and solving societal problems. Making solar energy economical, providing energy from fusion, sequestration, managing the nitrogen cycle, providing access to clean water. These are sustainability issues related to energy, food, water, and environment. Another set of challenges is in the area of health, engineering better medicines, advancing health informatics, and reverse engineering the brain, which is the most fundamental and interesting challenge if you think about it, given the fact that reverse engineering the brain will usher in tremendous uh, uh, opportunities, not only for people that have uh, uh, diseases of the brain to be able to um, uh, replace those functions, but conversely, create the other specter of people uh, sort of uh, uh, replacing the human in some sense by a machine. And so this is always the fine line that technology walks on, and I will mention this in a, uh, a little later on. Two other areas of, uh, uh, in the grand challenges include cybersecurity, securing cyberspace, huge challenge, preventing nuclear terror, restoring and improving the urban infrastructure, and enriching life. So in a way, this is a Maslow hierarchy thing, sustainable, health, secure, and then enriching life. And these are grand challenges that were sort of vetted by the National Academy. Uh, there was a, a collection of people that came up together and said, well, these are important areas that we have to uh, follow, to, uh, to pay attention to. Um, we follow on these challenges, and actually at USC, we held a national summit in 2010 that was preceded by Summit at Duke, and I'll show you some pictures from that. Uh, actually, Chuck Vest is the fellow uh, on the left at the top, and this is the organizing committee that included folks from Caltech, Duke, USC, and uh, all in college in uh, Massachusetts. This actually summit was, um, uh, became global last year, so there was a global summit organized in London, that was sponsored by the Royal Academy, and this is a picture from there, uh, the National Academy, and the Chinese Academy of Engineering to sort of look at the big global challenges that exist in the whole, in the area of engineering and technology. So this is sort of a movement that is going on, particularly uh, it spreads in universities, and there, is, uh, uh, there are um, or, uh, entities or organizations created at universities, particularly among students, on how to advance these grand challenges. The next summit is to be held in China a year from now. I'd like to talk a little bit about how technology evolves. And what I would like to do is focus on two uh, laws that appear to govern how technology uh, evolves. And I will give you these two models. And this will be the only quiz that will be done today. 
I'm going to use two equations, so please pay attention. Uh, those of you who have forgotten equations, you are forgiven. Uh, but I thought that uh, it would be an interesting way to, dis to invent something that I did not know that was possible. Perhaps someone has done this already, I'm not sure. So let's talk about how technology uh, evolves in time. The way we do that, let's assume that technology is described by A. A is the state of technology, okay? So it's some magical thing called A. If you have a linear dependence, meaning that the change in technology, delta A on the left, is proportional to the state of technology now, A, in time delta T, you can sort of integrate this equation. Again, those of you who took elementary calculus, you'll know how to do that. And the answer to that is an exponential. In other words, A is exponential of lambda T. And that exponential is nothing else but Moore's law. So Moore's law is derived because you assume that the change in technology today over, let's say, the next month is depend linearly to the state of technology that we have now. That makes sense. The more technology we have, the higher the rate by which this is going to happen. And if you do that, then you can get more slow. And this lambda parameter that says, which essentially in Moore's law says every 18 months, things double, can be different for different processes. Actually, I've, I've taken this particular slide for the Moore's law from, uh, from the internet, and this shows you the fact that if you plot things in the right way, they follow this exponential. And so it is possible that different uh, processes have a different rate, and I think this is true. Now, let's assume that you make a different assumption. And the assumption that you make is that the rate by which technology evolves is proportional to the square of A. In other words, you don't need only the state, the existing state, but it's sort of a convolution. A uh, conspire together in an enhanced way to produce new technology. If you do that, which is an enhancement of the ability to uh, uh, create new technology, you get something that I never thought possible, and what you get from that is a singularity. Those of you who are familiar with Kurzweil and company know that he has articulated the existence of a singularity. I'm not saying that that singularity will happen, but what I'm saying is that there is a model in simple equation model that can predict an, a singularity. This parameter T star is the time of this particular singularity. I can't tell you what it is because it depends on you know, some assumptions about what we do here, but this type of model that you have a quadratic dependence can actually lead to a singularity, which is here graphed. This is a graph I took also from the internet. I don't remember who, uh, whose uh, graph it is. But as you can see, uh, as a function of time, things move, and they move extremely fast near the singularity. So you can see it's not only exponential, it is really increasing very, very fast. So it seems to me that, uh, and the, there may be different times of singularity for different processes. So I have here some sort of a simplistic way to show you how potentially one can obtain different models or different approaches to describe how things evolve. In a, in a way, this is like a chemical reaction in which the linear model depends on the state itself. It's the same thing as in the, in the, in the opposite way, it's the same thing as radioactive decay in which things decay rather than grow exponentially. But if things happen at, as, a, as, a, as an enhancement of the, of the, of the particular state in a in a more important way by which it collides, if you like, you get this quadratic thing and gives rise to a singularity. I don't know if this is known or if Ray Kurzweil knows about it. I will certainly email him that and see what he says about that. I now want to go to one next step. In terms of complexity, I mentioned that phenomena could be physical, chemical, or biological, or combinations thereof. 
In increasing complexity, the next level of phenomenon that you can consider is social phenomenon. So my conjecture is that technology is not only going to be, and we see that obviously, remaining in exploiting physical, chemical, or biological phenomena, but is moving aggressively to social phenomena. Of course, you know, a, a simple way to do that, oh, and if I was to look at the grand challenges, which were sustainability, security, health, and enriching life, I would say that the National Academy missed an extra challenge, which has to do with society, societal organization, social media, how things behave, and so on and so forth. And I am asking, I'm, I'm, I'm conjecturing here that this is an area, well, I don't need to conjecture because we see it happening in front of our eyes, that this domain is, is going extremely fast, and the exploitation of this phenomena happens usually through digital media. And that is another thing that I want to tell you in just a moment. My definition of digital media, which is a little different than the traditional, and hopefully uh, you will see whether it's uh, provocative enough. Social, so you can see all these things, right? Wikipedia, so, uh, Facebook, the social phenomena underlying there is the, ability, the desire of people to share, the desire of people to exchange information, the desire of people to do things and this and that. That is a social phenomena, and the success of most of the startups are based on some sort of a social phenomenon that has been uh, taken advantage of. In, in that sense, I think that we have a huge convergence of disciplines, which I call engineering plus, and this is what we try to actually uh, do at the university, in which we look at engineering, and my colleagues in other uh, schools tell me that they are too engineering centric and sort of complain about that. But I look at engineering as a solar system in which, you know, around everything else, everything else rotates. So look, for example, computer science and go around the world or electrical engineering and go around the world. And as you go around the world, you will encounter natural sciences, you will encounter medicine, you will encounter arts, and you will encounter social sciences. So what I have in these boxes, whenever you see a color, is an area where our own faculty in engineering do work in these other areas. So the more colors you see, the more interdisciplinarity exists, and the more uh, empowering, if you like, is the discipline of engineering. And this is what I call engineering plus. One more thought. Between differences between physical and social. When you deal with physical phenomena, uh, those of you who read Nicholas Taleb's book, the, uh, uh, Last, the, Black, the Black Swan, he actually talks about that, and he calls it mediocrity. The distributions are all Gaussian, bell-shaped curves. They have very defined mean and a small standard deviation. Small correlation lengths, things decay very fast at the ends. There's a small variance, and the average prevails. If you read the Tom Friedman, he will tell you the average is dead. Nowadays, we don't have that. And the reason we don't have that is because in social phenomena, you don't have distributions that decay exponentially fast but decay as a power law, and I will explain that in a moment. I should mention that there's an exception to this in physical phenomena, because if you do unstable phenomena, turbulence, and so on and so forth, uh, some of the statistics are not Gaussian, but that I should, I should leave aside. When you look at social phenomena, on the other hand, most of the distributions are non-Gaussian. There are, there are long tails. Taleb calls this the extremistan, there are large correlation lengths. The variance is uh, inadequate. So there are decays that are, take very long to, to, uh, to, to go to zero. And therefore, you may have very high variances. In fact, there is a certain distribution where the average exists, but the variance is infinite. And this happens, for example, if the decay, this parameter A that I have up there, happens to be between 2 and 3. So for a particular uh, number like that, you may have distributions that actually give you an infinite variance, 
and even though you have a finite mean. So that's actually a very interesting characteristic of the difference between social and physical phenomena. Physical phenomena are very uh, average in some sense. Social phenomena have huge correlation lengths and therefore very long decays. And that has to do with the fact that int the internet allows you to percolate very fast everywhere so the correlation lengths become infinitely large because you know the six degrees of separation or whatever it is allows people to connect across multiple places everywhere whereas for a physical phenomenon to happen it will take not a miracle but it takes a lot of things for this to happen and this is represented by a geometry which is fract called fractal I just, those of you who may know about it this is uh, so I will close with a how you investigate social phenomena and physical phenomena if you are in the natural sciences you do the following you probe matter with tools and stimuli. You observe and record re responses through sensors. You characterize very accurately the physical, chemical, and biological state. You know exactly what you're dealing with. You speculate various laws, then explore the range of behavior, and then you establish a phenomenon. And technology comes in to exploit this phenomenon for useful purposes. We do this routinely in physical sciences. We take the sample, we measure it, we record it, we play around it, we repeat the experiment, everything is nice, you get a law, good, congratulations, you publish, you get a phenomenon, people take it and, and develop a technology. Let's go to social sciences. In social sciences, you actually use a different tool. And in my mind, this is really digital media in, more generally, in the more general sense. And what you do, you don't probe, probe matter, you probe people. You probe subsets of, subsets of people. And you do this through social media, through videos, movies, also through events, products, and the like. Then you observe and record responses, mostly digitally. And you try to characterize the behavioral response. But I would, I would argue that you do this incompletely because we don't have the mathematical tools to characterize social behavior well. That area is extremely rich for new uh, developments. And I think this is in a, a place where engineering and computer science is moving very aggressively to bring tools and, uh, and uh, methodologies that can be used for that. Then you speculate you perhaps observe a phenomenon, and after that, you establish the exploit of phenomenon for useful purposes. So I'm going to go here on LIMP and make the following statement. What microscopes and mass spectrometers are to the natural sciences, digital media are to the social sciences. So that's something that I am, I'm going to put there. Uh, uh, and, you know, a statement to be thrown away or, or <laughs> see how, how you, we can feel about that. I will close by mention the other word in this definition which is useful. What's useful for someone is not useful for another. So this brings immediately ethical, moral, policy and unintended consequences issues. So in a very simple description of technology, you can understand why ethics and technology and policy are so important because what is useful for someone may not be useful for another. My close is to give a, a plug for the innovation uh, that we do at USC. Uh, we have a Viterbi Student Innovation Institute and we have a Viterbi Startup Garage that started uh, last year and incubated 10 companies. And this is a, a, a here in Silicon Beach. And uh, so we are, with, we are extremely uh, proud of uh, creating a, an entrepreneurship and innovation activity here in Los Angeles based on tech. And I think we uh, like this to be enhanced and be improved. And we welcome your participation in, in helping establish this ecosystem of innovation in Los Angeles, which I think has a tremendous potential and opportunity. My final slide is borrowed by David Deutsch, which is a quantum physicist at Oxford, 
the, wrote the book called The Beginning of Infinity. David says, there will always be problems. Problems are inevitable. But all problems are solvable. And that's what we try to uh, impart to our students at USM. Thank you.